Hello, and welcome to a new episode of The Career Changers. Our guest today is Lisa Markowitz, founder of the International Foundation Pariba, Ecuador's first nationwide online directory of support resources for women's victims of violence, who is now aiming to expand her efforts to Latin America and the Spanish-speaking population in the U.S., Through a new venture, Hone It Baby, and their upcoming course from Caterpillar to Butterfly, Shepherding Women from Trauma to Joy, Lisa continues to innovate in the realm of healing and empowerment. By incorporating heart and self-expression into her work, she believes in the transformative power of creativity, particularly for Gen X women navigating trauma. Today, we are going to inspire you with her career change journey, how she found her life purpose, and some special tips for you during your journey to self-realization. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with your background. How did you start your professional life? Or better, what was your first job? Well... Honestly, I think my first job beyond being a babysitter was scooping ice cream <laughs> at the ice cream parlor in Manhattan. And I had the, the joy and the honor of serving Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis mm-hmm. a scoop of ice cream. So that's a fun little story to start out with. Uh, it's clearly, an incredible that's story. My, <laughs> yeah, that's, it is a nice story. It's not really my first professional job. I've worked in sales. I have 30 years of experience as a writer an editor, a translator, uh, doing everything you can imagine with words. Uh, that's that's really been what, what I have started out my life doing. And I had a parallel career. Uh, when I got older, I started doing what I really wanted to do from the time I was a kid, which was to sing. So I've, uh, I've done an awful lot of things with words, with notes, and that led to some other things as well. And what was your dream job when you were a child? Oh, I wanted to be Mary Poppins. Oh, <laughs> we never heard About, that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to be Mary Poppins in the sense of being a nanny. What I really wanted was to be Julie Andrews. I wanted to be up on stage. I wanted to be singing. I wanted to be dancing. I wanted to be entertaining. Um, the little girl inside of me still loves that. And I think that has a lot to do um, with the the singing career that I have developed since. Mm. And what is your educational background? What did you decide to study? So I am, again, I'm multifaceted. I've studied a lot of different things. I had a liberal arts degree as my bachelor's degree at college, and it was focused on Spanish, the language, the culture, the literature. Uh, And then I did a master's in international relations with a focus on development from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. So there's, again, it's more ways of figuring out how to get people to communicate, how to solve problems in the world, uh, how to establish dialogue. It all sort of, in, in my mind, it all sort of flows around the same thing, but I know a lot of people find it hard to understand how you can move in so many different areas at once. But I, I just see it as ways to connect with people. Mm. And so you mentioned you did different jobs, you had different uh, careers, if we can say so. So how did you progress uh, um, in your working life before um, a moment, uh, an enlightening moment you had 12 years ago that we will talk about it later, um, when you started to focus on uh, um, supporting women that have been suffering um, violence? Well, I, I guess that I could say to you that on the one hand, I, I I did most of my for-profit work around words. So I had my own entrepreneurial venture. It was a, a boutique bilingual bicultural communications agency. I did a lot of writing, editing, translating. Uh, I, I wasn't able to share much of that with the world because it was generally... Um, either confidential or it was used to create marketing documents or websites or things like that. Uh, but my name wasn't on it. I didn't do it as an a published author. I was the ghostwriter behind everything, making everybody else sound good um, and trying to make them sound like themselves, but better. 
uh, that pretty much culminated. I lived for 30 years in Ecuador. I'm not from there, but I lived there for 30 years. And I would say the the biggest position I held in that sense was running communications for Ecuador's largest inbound tourism agency. We used to bring uh, tourists from around the world to the Galapagos Islands, to Quito, Ecuador, which is the capital. And I was in charge of all of the communications in, it was a 600 person company. And uh, we had a lot going on. We had six different products of our own. We represented thousands of other products. And so I was in charge of the entire communications um, sphere for the company. That was that was my role. Mm -hmm. So in your career change journey, there was a significant moment uh, um, 12 years ago when you saw the news uh, uh, report about a young woman attack in India. How did that episode impact you personally? Well, it was very impactful. And to this day, when I think about it, it's still gives me a mixture of fury and impotence and just chills at some level. And and I did, over the course of time, discover that there were other people who had been reluctant, like me, to get involved in this very huge issue of violence against women that's going on around the world um, that were impacted by this same event. It was the New Delhi gang rape. I will not go into detail because it's it's gruesome and um, your listeners, if they are curious to know what it's about, can certainly look it up. But it was a brutal attack on a young woman and her boyfriend, as it so happens. And I saw this and something just woke up in me and said, I can't live in a world that does this anymore. I have two boys. Uh, I do not have girls, but I have two boys. And I said, I don't want them to grow up in a world like this. I don't want anyone they are with to have to have to go through something like this. What can I do about it? And um, it was sort of a question of what can one person do about such a big thing as violence against women? It's a huge, huge topic. Uh, and 12 years in, I will tell you that I've made a dent and I haven't made a dent and there's so much more to be done. Um, but the moment that this came about, I said, what can I do? And I said, well, I have to do something that only that I can do alone. And I said, what am I good at? And then what are my superpowers? I guess I would say that now. I didn't ask it in those words back then. But nowadays, I'd say, what are my superpowers? And my superpowers are working with words and working with notes. And I took a poem that I had started writing, and I transformed it into a song. And I decided that a song can really move far beyond its composer. It can get out into the world. It can inspire people to want to make a change in their own lives and their community. Uh, and so I wrote this song, which has led into so many other things. The song itself is a semi-finalist winner at the International Songwriting Competition. Um, so it has done well as a song in that sense. Um, but it also, perhaps more importantly, has inspired this entire movement to empower communities to take back their own power and women to take back their own power and, and stop this at the roots rather than waiting until it has become a, a horrible thing that is you know going through the international media and terrifying all of us. So that's how it all happened. So what, what is the name of the song? Where can we find it if you want to listen to it? Of course, it's it's called No More, No Mas. It's the two words in English and Spanish. And you can look it up under my name, Lisa Markovitz, if you'd like. I don't know how you do this with your listeners, but I can send you a direct link to it. But it's on all streaming platforms. Um, no More is kind of a popular title for songs, evidently. So it's easier if you look it up under my name, Lisa Markovitz. But you can hear it on any streaming platform that you like. Oh, we will do definitely. So let's Thank talk you. about your move from New York to Ecuador. So that must have been quite a, a transition. Uh, how did your mm -hmm. experience in Ecuador shape your perspective on issues like violence against women? Well, I, I like to joke. I say that I went from the center of the world to the middle of the world because those of us who live in New York tend to think that New York is the center of the world. Of course, there are so many important cities around the, the world, but it is a, a, an important place and a trendsetter. And that's where I spent a lot of time. And then I moved to the middle of the world because Ecuador is literally on the equator. Um, and moving there when I did 30 some odd years ago was like jumping back two generations uh, in terms of what women were able to do, how society treated us. Um, there were so many times where I 
absolutely had to face discrimination because I was a woman, uh, where it was assumed, even though I was coming out of a top master's degree uh, and was clearly smart enough and willing to do the work and interested in doing work, that people would say to me, well, you're just going to have coffee and have babies. So, you know, come on board and we won't pay you anything. And it wasn't one interview, it was 30. Um, and, and that really set me off on an entrepreneurial journey, which continues to this day, because I just couldn't find any uh, satisfying work that I could be well paid for and, and gain respect. And uh, it took a long time to eventually move into the spaces that I'm telling you that I ended up in. But at the beginning, it was very, very hard. And um, Ecuador, like many Latin American countries, is machista, that's chauvinistic. Um, there is a huge gap between what men do and what women do. Uh, there are, of course, some very good relationships, but as a society, it is unfortunately quite sick. And the statistics uh, continue to, to show that in terms of the number of femicides, the number of women who have lived violence. I can share all of those numbers with you later if you're interested in it, but on an everyday basis, um, it was very, very difficult when I moved there. It really was going back to before uh, any kind of women's lib movement had ever existed. It, it felt like that. I'm not saying it's true, but that's what it felt like moving down there. It was a huge, huge change, not to mention the fact that there were still sometimes cows on the streets of the capital. And I was from Manhattan, right? So this was a, a very, very big change. And it's not that way anymore, but um, unfortunately, violence against women still persists. Mm -hmm. So apart, uh, as part of this journey, uh, at some point, you created an international foundation, the Pariba Foundation, and launched uh, OESARA. Um, you can explain more to our listener what is it. And uh, this is a significant undertaking, especially considering the fact that uh, um, there was a lack of funding and uh, the foundation was based on a volunteer uh, team. So how did you um, how did you find the strength to 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 create and run this project? That's a good question. It's one I ask myself every single day for the last uh, ten years. Um, let me share a little bit about how it organically evolved. I think that would give you a little bit more of an idea. And as I said, we are we're very unusual because because we started with a song. Most foundations go to somebody to write their theme song after they're already working. Ours started with a song. Uh, this, this song that I do hope people will, will go and, and listen to, it's in Spanish, but there are English translations to it. Um, it. It's an anthem song. And it was a call to the world to say, done, no more. I don't want to see this anymore. And I got funding to produce the song, and it has some wonderful uh, Latin Grammy winners, producers, musicians on it um, from Ecuador, from Colombia. And I got funding to do that production from the US Embassy in Ecuador. Um, I knew people in the embassy because I used to serve on the board of the Fulbright Commission in Ecuador. And um, they suggested that I make a proposal to the embassy at the time to get funding, and they funded us. And so we produced the song. And when we took it and we turned it into a um, a workshop, a proprietary workshop, which has then become the basis for From Caterpillar to Butterfly, which I hope we'll have time to talk about a little bit later. Um, but at any rate, we did this workshop and the workshop used my music as a muse for people to make their own art. And we were trying to denormalize the concepts that led to violence against women to say it's not normal to think that you are less. It's not normal to think that this is okay or that is okay. And we, we played around with that a lot. And we slowly but surely, with the support of the community, developed this workshop. And then people would go through the workshop and they would have so much fun and they didn't realize how much it would impact them afterwards. Because art is far more powerful than we realize. Music gets to places that our brain has been trying to hide from us. And so people would say, oh my gosh, I now realize I need more help. And so we found another methodology where we could hold space for people, always in group settings. It was never one-on-one. -on -one. It was never uh, a, one psychologist with one person. I am not a psychologist. I will say that straight up. I'm not a lawyer. I don't shepherd people through systems that are broken. Neither does my foundation. We try to disrupt the system. We try to make the whole system work better. And we would do these spaces where we would do mental health support, uh, community-based. We've been doing it for six years. We've attended 6,000 people at this point once a week. Uh, for many, many years. 
And then we realized that we sometimes needed to refer people places and we didn't know where to refer them because our methodology took us to a certain point, but they needed more help. And we slowly but surely started figuring out where we could send them and then the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, we were no longer receiving people in our Zoom room just from Quito where we had been used to working, but from the entire country. And then we had to keep looking for who could help. And this actor mapping, as we call it technically, is what led to the creation of Oyesara, which this means, hey, Sarah. And Sarah is an acronym and it stands for Advanced Support Resource System. And it is an online platform that allows people in Ecuador, we chose a number of vulnerable groups, women, children, LGBTQ, and the migrant and refugee population. And we put up online um, a directory where anyone within a, just a couple of clicks from a phone, from a tablet, from a computer, could find information about the place where they could go to get help. We didn't recommend a particular one over another one, but we did make it easy for people to make their take their first steps because before this, it was very hard to find out where to go, especially if you lived outside of the big cities. And uh, the response to the platform has been enormous. We have approximately 20 to 25,000 people going in every month. Uh, these are unique visitors to the platform in a country of 18 million people. And um, we have had wonderful help. I've had Carla Sambrano as a psychologist. She supervised the mental health and the, the actor mapping portion. Uh, Javier Paez with, with his company Synergy Social did the development work. And now people have this wonderful, wonderful resource. As to how we made it happen, we just all believed in it. And some music and I don't know, maybe something about me, or maybe something about the project, maybe something about the cause. We've inspired hundreds of people to come help us do this work. Um, it's gotten to a point where we cannot do it just as volunteers anymore. We have so many plans. We want to replicate this platform. We've shown it to people in other Latin American countries. They've all said, oh my gosh, I wish we had that here. Because if you're a victim of violence, again, without wanting to be crude, uh, but you often only have a couple of minutes where you can sneak into the bathroom or into your room and look up help. And if you have to spend hours and hours doing it, and you have perhaps spotty internet connectivity, or you have an old phone, or, or, or all these things that are common in Ecuador, it's hard to find the information. So um, this was our way of doing it. And how have I held on sheer grit? I can't say it any other way. There have been so many times where I have wanted to throw in the towel. This has been uh, difficult work. It has pulled me away from things that I could have done to sustain myself, to sustain my family. But I believed in what I was doing, and I still do. And um, that's why I'm here. I'm here to talk about it, to share, and to see if other people can join in on this dream and help us make it a reality because we can help so many more people. Mm. So let's talk about your new venture, Hone It Baby, and your upcoming course from Caterpillar to Butterfly, Shepherding Women from Trauma to Joy. What inspired you to create this course and what do you hope participants will gain from it? So as the title says, it's from Caterpillar to Butterfly. And when women have gone through situations in an unhealthy relationship, and it doesn't have to be full-blown violence, the course is not only for people who've been in very dramatic cases. It's for anyone who has had their heart broken and has perhaps come to realize that what they were living was not healthy and that they allowed this type of relationship to be a part of their lives. And we've all pretty much all been through something like that at some point at different levels. And there's a whole, there's a whole spectrum. The foundation works on the, on the most extreme part. This is really much broader and much more open. This is work based on the proprietary art and music workshop that I started with 10 years ago, uh, and that has developed. We did some work as a foundation. We did a University of Delaware uh, sponsored study where we took this proprietary art and music workshop in a virtual format. We adapted it and combined it with this other methodology we were doing. And we found statistically significant proof that women felt more supported, they felt healthier, they felt better. 100% of women wanted to either recommend the course or continue with it. And the only thing that they suggested to us at the end of it is they wanted more self-expression. They said, we wanna be able to be creative. It's great to come and talk. It's wonderful to have these safe and brave spaces where we can join together and share our experience, but we need to create more. And as an artist, I identified with that. 
And so I said, hmm, there's something interesting going on here. Let's connect the dots. Let's see what we can come up with. And I adapted what we have done this wonderful research on into an online course that's going to let any woman, especially a Gen X woman, because I feel that, that that's my best, um, the, the best group I can hold space for in a way that they will really feel seen and heard and supported. Um, it, for us to learn how to recognize when things aren't so good in our relationships, how to strengthen ourselves, how to move forward into joy. And that's that's how this course came about. And how does it tie back into the foundation? Well, for every course I sell, I'm going to be giving a $5 donation back to the foundation. So when women help themselves, they're helping me to help everybody else as well. So it all just sort of ties back in together. And um, it's an invitation to, to get past whatever weighs you down. We all have a lot of baggage from those unhealthy relationships and move into joy and move into happiness, move into the full life we are meant to live. And that um, we haven't perhaps managed it yet, but there's still time. There's always time. So incorporating heart and self-expression into your course is a unique approach to healing, but you use the um, worldwide in different ways, in different forms. How do you believe creativity can facilitate the journey from trauma to joy? I'm going to share a little bit about my personal experience when I talk about this. Uh, I was raised in a household in New York where academics and intellect were very much prized and the math class was always more important than choir. Um, and there is a lot of importance in working on our brains, on our intellects, on our mind, on our academic knowledge. I absolutely believe in that. Uh, our brains are important. But I, having lived 30 years in a Latin American country, which tends to go to the other extreme where the heart is <laughs> the most important and we're not always thinking about decisions, we're just going out and doing them because that's what we feel. I have come to realize that when we try to make decisions of the heart with the brain, it doesn't work. It's that simple. It just doesn't work because the heart knows what it wants and the brain's job is to implement it. And um, I, I really feel like a lot of us have been raised in societies that naturalize this type of power imbalances, of acceptance of things that are not so good for women. It doesn't always mean it's good for men. And I'm not against men, by the way. I want to lay that out really clearly. Uh, I have two boys and I have a wonderful partner and I'm pro-men. But I'm pro-men being fully in themselves and the women being fully in themselves and coming together in a more complete, healthy way. And if we are constantly listening to the chatter in our brain that has been placed there by our society, our school, our work, our parents, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a well-meaning girlfriend, um, then perhaps we can't really hear our heart. And creativity and self-expression allow us to get to that inner voice. They are the purest representation of who we really are. And they are a fun way that allow us to relax our barriers that again, we have created in our mind generally, release some of the layers of the onion, so to speak, and get to what we need to get to. Because in the end, we are all light on the inside and we all know what is good for us. And if we are in a relationship that is going bad for, or we had one 20 years ago, we still feel it, we know. Our inner voice was screaming about it and our brain didn't want to let us hear. So if we get into creativity, if we get into art, if we get into music and by art, any kind of art, it can be painting, it can be sculpting, it can be knitting, it can be cooking, whatever makes you happy. Um, but when we go into that space of creativity, we are dropping much of society and, and its rules to the side and we can actually connect to who we are. And that's why I think that this is incredibly powerful work. And yet it's gentle. It's, it's a much easier way to face the things that we have not wanted to face. Because if we have faced this type of problem, we still generally carry around shame, guilt, frustration, anger, sadness. And so we avoid it, but it just keeps us from letting our light really shine. So what is the goal? Come with me, share, listen to music, dance, play, paint, sculpt, whatever makes you feel you. And then you'll feel safer and braver to keep taking your step forward. 
So building a business and launching a course require a lot of dedication and perseverance, and you have experienced this um, on yourself. What advice would you give uh, uh, to aspiring entrepreneurs who want to make a positive impact in their community um, like you did and you're doing? Well, thank you for saying that I'm making a positive impact. I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll take it in my name as well as my team's. Um, so first of all, be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. Do things that you believe in because it will be hard and you need to get up in the morning and be willing to keep at it. And so it has to be something you care about deeply and that um, hopefully showcases the best of you and allows you to shine uh, and make sure that it's going to be sustainable for you. That is a mistake that I made with my foundation and I'm not willing to make it anymore, which is why well, I've moved into this space of a for-profit course that nevertheless has a very socially conscious purpose. I would also suggest getting expert help, whatever that means to you. Do you need a coach? Do you need an accountant? Do you need a lawyer? Do you need a buddy, a biz bestie who can support you through it? Don't try to do it alone. It, it is an awful lot of work. And um, be willing to question and to drop your fears and to get past your tech gremlins and any other gremlins that are there telling you that you're not good enough because you are, you are good enough and you can make it through and it, it will take perseverance, but you can do it. And it's worthwhile. It's absolutely worthwhile. And what advice would you give to anyone during their journey to self-realization? Well, honestly, the methodology that I'm trained in would tell me not to give advice, but rather to share from my own perspective Listen to your inner child, the inner girl, the inner boy, whatever you identify with, listen to him, to her, to it, to they, um, to them. I have trouble with the pronouns I'm trying. Um, but listen to that inner child because your inner child knows who you are and knows what you want. And try to make sure that that inner child feels safe and feels ready to take steps forward. And go at it with fun and, and go at it looking for the joy, trusting in yourself and surrounding yourself with people who truly believe in you. And that's the space that I'm trying to hold in my course, even if it's sight unseen because it is fully online. Um, but I'm trying to be that space so that everyone can look in a mirror and say, I want to see myself the way that she sees me with potential, with possibility and um with happiness so before the last question we're reaching the end of this episode uh, we just want to ask you and we ask this to um, all of our guests uh, um, how do you feel you are making the world a better place often we forget uh, what is the impact of our work uh, but you're doing uh, something amazing but how do you feel you're making a difference well Sometimes I feel like I'm not making enough of a difference because the problem is so big. It is so big that any work any one of us can do is always a drop in a bucket. But I do believe that with the help of my team, we have created incredibly innovative tools that are massively, potentially even more massively helping so many people to take the first steps. And I think taking a first step whether you're living full-blown violence, like is the case where we have helped with the foundation, or whether you are living something that for you is big, even if it's not a legal case, um, just to empower people to say, I can live better, I can be happier, I don't have to accept this as normal. We are promoting a massive cultural shift. And I think that's necessary in the world. It certainly was necessary in my life, continues to be necessary in my life, I see my children growing up with very different attitudes in their relationships because of the work I have done on myself and for society. And in the end, that's really what we can do is we can help ourselves, we can help the people around us. And then some of us are called to try to help more people. But in the end, if you change one life, that's already pretty amazing. And I'm very proud of what we've done. And I know of many stories that I can tell some of which I tell in the course, uh, others which I've told on social media of, of people whose lives have been changed because they realized that they don't have to be victims anymore and they can stand strong and they can own it, baby. And that's why the company is called what it's called is because we can own it. 
we can be the best version we want to be and we can get past whatever or whomever told us we couldn't. And um, that's what it means. That's mm -hmm. what it means. So we are really at the end now and we're just going to ask you the last question. If you could give yourself a piece of advice, what would you say to your younger self? What Lisa would say to younger Lisa? Never stop singing. <laughs> Never stop singing. Sing your heart out. Sing your heart out and everything else will follow. It will pull whatever you need into you and whatever your dream is, follow it and always take care of yourself. Um, because you can't take care of others unless you are also well taken care of. That's what well, I'd say, be as big as you can. Well, thank you, Lisa, so much for joining us today and sharing your inspirational career story and wisdom with our listeners. Thank you so much for having me. And the last message to our listeners, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and tune in next week for a new inspirational episode of The Career Changes. Thank you.